The Hong Kong Institute of Chartered Secretaries recently held its 12th biennial Corporate Governance Conference. In the following session, two speakers share their views on how to protect the board of a company. The first speaker is Dr. Moses Cheng, Chairman of the Insurance Authority. He talks about how good governance is interpreted in order to build a suitable corporate structure with a sound risk culture. Ladies and gentlemen, I chose the title Being Fit and Proper, the best protection down the line. And I'm sure that you will appreciate the reason why I chose this topic. Because as the insurance regulator, and if you read the insurance ordinance, you can see the importance we attach to the fit and proper criteria in terms of the board, the choice of the board members, the choice of the senior management, and most important of all, the choice of the professional running the insurance business. This must be the best prediction for the policyholders. Now, um, I think uh, you all agree with me that uh, our world is facing some unprecedented challenges these days. A pandemic that has completely changed our life a global economic downturn that is likely to be the worst since the Great Depression, and the increasingly complicated international situation. It has become more important than ever for us to discuss the topic of corporate governance, which plays a crucial role in protecting members of the public, our businesses, and our markets against crisis. Speaking in the capacity of the Chairman of the Insurance Authority, I would like to talk about how we, as the regulator of the insurance industry, interpret good governance, and in this context, the important principle of being fit and proper, which we trust should be the best protection down the line. A lot of people ask, what is good governance? And I'm sure that members sitting in the audience as well as those watching online would agree that good governance is more than just compliance with the law and regulations. In fact, if I may share with you a quotation, uh, something which uh, the former CEO of the UK IOD said um, at one of the conferences that I attended, and let me just share with you what he said. He said, and I quote, what boards must seek to avoid at all costs is slipping into a compliance mentality where they know all the rules, follow them assiduously, but are responsible for destruction of value through failure to remember the main role. So for all these years, I've been sharing with different regulators, you no doubt understand that I serve on the board of the Stock Exchange, and I serve formerly as on the listing committee, and I do work closely with the SFC, and being the chairman of their procedure review panel for six years, I share with them, I said, look, I mean, if it's very well that you control the companies, the business activities, to the extent that no problem would arise. But is that the objective of good corporate governance? Corporate governance is no good if it does not serve the real purpose, the main purpose of the company, and that is to bring reasonable return to the investor. If we can't do that, then it is not good corporate governance. So ladies and gentlemen, let's just look at what is governance. Governance refers to the policy, processes, and structures used by an organization or government to direct and control its activities, to achieve its objectives, and to protect the interests of its diverse group of stakeholders in a manner consistent with appropriate ethical standards. Ladies and gentlemen, I emphasize ethical standards. A lot of problem, a lot of problem we face these days is people 
trying to beat the ethical standard and people entering into practices that is far from being honest act that they need to do. Good corporate governance helps company build trust with their stakeholders, investors, clients, and the community. And a lot of problem corporation, a lot of governments that are facing problem is because of the lack of trust between the corporation, the government, and their stakeholders. So this trust is extremely important. And I emphasize a lot to people in the insurance industry. I said, that's something which we must be able to demonstrate to the whole world, that the insurance industry is a trustworthy industry. And in fact, when I started to work with them some years ago, I realized how stringent they are in terms of their internal control. But on the other hand, that was not being sort of publicly known to stakeholders in the community. The Second King's Report, published in 2002, said, and I quote, Governance is essentially a function of leadership and direction within an organization. And appropriate risk management and control over its activities, bracket management, and the manner in which meaningful disclosure relating to activities is made to the shareholders and other stakeholders, bracket public engagement. This is exactly what I said. With effective public engagement, we will be able to let stakeholders understand what we're trying to do as a corporation, as an organization, as a government. And with this understanding, the trust can be built. As I mentioned before, the focus today would be on fit and proper. And I will now try to explain how this concept can be applied to overall corporate governance framework. The board of a corporation plays the most significant role in formulating policies on corporate governance. Firstly, it has to acknowledge that good corporate governance is essential to the corporate so that it can drive the relevant strategy from the highest level. The board can be viewed as a powerful engine of a high performance vehicle. That is the corporate. Besides the engine, I'm sure you know that we still need a number of factors, for example, like a good driver, the navigator, the fuel, the lubricant, etc., to maximize the performance of the vehicle. And these factors may all have their own function and can perform independently. But for the vehicle to perform at its best, moving in the same direction and towards the same destination, they must be able to work well together. The key of ensuring this factor work together is for the board to build a suitable corporate structure, the proper strategy, and direct a sound risk culture. A suitable corporate structure has to be one that supports the corporate achievement of strategy. The board being ultimately responsible for all the activities of the corporate should establish its oversight responsibilities with delegation to board committees and senior management. There are some elements of proper corporate governance which are closely linked to building a suitable corporate structure. Firstly, the directors have to be fit and proper. They should be able to fulfill the requirement on diverse experience, skills, knowledge, character, and most important of all, integrity, and continue to sharpen their knowledge to keep up with market trends. There should also be proper nomination procedures, performance review, and succession planning. Secondly, a suitable corporate structure should ensure proper check and balances through segregation of duties 
and identification of appropriate and independent reporting lines. Last but not the least, it should take into account how to handle properly conflict of interest by avoidance, disclosure, or appropriate prior approval. Apart from a suitable corporate structure, the board should also nurture a sound risk culture, which reflects the value, appetite, and norms of business behavior, drive good practices and informed decision, and facilitate proper risk management and compliance. In nurturing a sound risk culture, there are also some factors for the board to consider. For example, the risk management committee delegated by the board should formulate detailed implementation plans for the board to approve. A top-down approach should be adopted to provide clarity and guidance, but measures should also be put in place to ensure that employees at all levels comprehend, take ownership, and follow through the policies. Business plans should be devised in a long-term and forward-looking perspective, and the remuneration structure should be appropriate to avoid excessive or unreasonable risk-taking behavior by executives. A sound rich culture should safeguard the rights of all stakeholders. In the insurance industry, policyholders are very important stakeholders. Insurers should uphold the principle of fair treatment of customers and keep in mind that they have the obligation to fulfill contract terms stipulated in insurance policy. Any deviation would expose the insurers to conduct risks or other unnecessary liabilities. By implementing policy on fair treatment of customers, the chance of engaging in dishonesty and unethical practices before, during, and after the point of sales would be minimized. And then, ladies and gentlemen, the major principle of the fair treatment of customers cover the various aspects, including, firstly, provision of information. Now, provision of good and understandable information is of paramount importance. Secondly, is upholding of professionalism and then suitability of the product. Now, this is very important. As I time and again reminded our in insurance industry intermediaries, it is the absolute responsibility to understand the need of the client before they can recommend suitable and appropriate products for them. And finally, most important aspect of this treatment of customer, fair treatment of customer, it must be meeting reasonable expectation. As the insurance regulator of Hong Kong, the insurance authority has high expectation on all our regularities in practicing good corporate governance. Insurance is a business based on trust. Obligation of the insurers to do their policyholders commence when the coverage begins. By developing sound corporate governance, insurers can demonstrate to the policyholders their long-term commitment. With a proper corporate governance framework, we expect that insurers should be able to detect risks or imperfection in the business operation through internal audit or complaints received. An enterprise risk management and ERM framework should be in place for involving business cycle of the company and multiple stages of product development. They should also be able to resolve and rectify problems early before the problem exacerbate and become difficult to manage. There should be positive feedback loop for the insurers to improve and support moderate growth and stability. The ultimate objective, ladies and gentlemen, is to benefit policyholders, the insurers, the industry as a whole. It's an all-win formula rather than one-sided 
formula. So as a regulator, the insurance authority would like to see not only the economic value, but also the social value of insurance to be realized. We have witnessed how insurers expedite claim process and provide additional protection during the COVID-19 pandemic, realizing the social value of insurance. We would also like to see insurers to act reasonably with due regards to the rights of policyholder by adopting a proper corporate governance framework and building tom at the top, which are essential in guiding the insurers to move in the right direction. And we hope insurers can fulfill their social responsibility and serving the uninsured and the underinsured population when devising their business plan by taking into account the accessibility and affordability of the various types of insurance products in the market. To do that, we need the support of every one of you in the community, especially all of you who are joining us at this conference today. Corporate Secretary, Executive, Administrators and Directors, promoting and reminding corporate boards the need to act with integrity, to do good in serving the need of people, and to be conscious of the social impact of the business and investment of the corporation. And I would like to end with this quotation from Aesop, which said, and I quote, no act of kindness, no matter how small, is ever wasted. On that note, may I take this opportunity to thank the HKICS for inviting me to share my thoughts at this conference today. And I wish you all and your loved ones good health and strength in the days and time ahead. Thank you very much. The second speaker is Mr. Andrew Weir, Regional Senior Partner of KPMG Hong Kong and Vice Chairman of KPMG China. He discusses 10 steps for managing risk and safeguarding the board and the company. I am privileged on the various roles I've had of like, I've just stepped down during the Stock Exchange Listing Committee and I sit on various boards, public and charity, and then also the day job at KPMG, we see so much. Um, it is a privilege um, to see it. And every now and again, it's very useful to take a step back and think we know what needs to be shared and taking that whole volume and then trying to bring it down into something manageable. I've been trying to work out what was the right word. And it is exactly this, safeguarding. And I, I think this is a real watchword uh, for all of us uh, as directors and company secretaries. The, the fiduciary duty is one thing in terms of legal obligations, but in very practical terms, it is safeguarding. And that's the spirit within, within which I've come up with a fairly homespun uh, top 10 steps. But the, they are based on an element of intellectual rigor and practical experience. So forgive me, but hopefully I know we've got very clever people here. It gives food for thought. And as you're working your way through the logical sequence of the conference, hopefully there's a few things here you think, you know what, maybe we should have a look at that. So there you are on a slide. Uh, these are the 10 steps. Um, and um, let me just uh, really talk my way through this. Uh, as Moses says, you know, we're in unprecedented times. Um, crisis doesn't accurately describe um, what we've been facing. And actually in Hong Kong, I've been using the analogy of black swans. There are four black swans swimming and they're gonna be swimming for quite a long time. Um, basically, we have the social unrest, local recession, pandemic, and then global recession. All I'd say on the pandemic is a global health crisis became a global economic crisis, but hasn't yet permeated its way through the system to become a global financial crisis, and that will come. And I think that's something which is, is something we, we've all got to bear in mind. And there is definitely a, an excessive air of optimism um, about the global economy in comparison to the reality, even though what you hear is negative. 
So um, I think we've got to be very mindful of the next six, 12 months. It can be hugely difficult. That puts fundamental pressure on every organization, every company. And the world in which we live in now, everything speaks. The first thing I did at KPMG when the crisis really came, we've got big operations in China, like many of you, was in China's New Year. And I kept reinforcing to people how we act, how we behave with our clients, our people, suppliers, regulators, everybody, will be assessed in three years' time. And it won't take into account the practical challenges we have. So in other words, how we behave and act, how we conduct ourselves, will be held to a very high lens in a few years' time. The lens will not be forgiving about the practical realities. And one of the toughest things I had as uh, the boss of KPMG in Hong Kong is stopping people thinking they're doing the right thing by taking shortcuts or coming to partial solutions to get a task done and the risk of missing the bigger picture about are things being done the right way. So I just wanted to share that as, uh, as something I think very important. And that got me thinking on these steps. I think the first one is, here is an opportunity to reinforce the role of board and committees. I remember we, we were on a, a panel a year or two ago here, and I used the expression board grip. What is the grip the board has on the organization? And there's a lot of serious discussion in the UK. And I've had a couple of interviews, actually. I was surprised they called up, which is, are we seeing directors, particularly INEDs, getting more involved in day-to-day -day operations? Or is there a material change in oversight? But that balance between leading, oversight, and governance, and doing and control, the balance needs to be on the table and be discussed. A few other things very relevant to that is the responsibility of the roles in the committees. We all have an annual process whereby we probably have a look at how the board's done. We probably look at whether the audit committee, let's say, in particular, has done its role. Question, are we rigorous enough on that? Do we have enough rigor and vigor on the reporting lines? Do we need to tighten and get more clarity on the roles and responsibilities. Even if we don't, it's a good practice to go through. And that brings on to the second point. When you speak to regulators or you speak to a quality regulated entity, about 70% of the discussion now is about conduct. Not a narrowly defined, as, you, as you, you're dead right, Moses, not a narrowly defined conduct in the form of complying with procedures. Mm -hmm. It's how you behaved. And it links into this changing reality of the power of the customer, the power of people who aren't economically vested in the old way of thinking in the business, but in the new way of thinking are. And this sort of conduct, culture, and compliance, I call it the three Cs. Very good time to ask oneself, truly, where are we? The HKMA brought in the concept of culture a few years back, and it was very smart, actually, because I stand to be corrected, but my read of it is what they're saying is, however good your policies and procedures are, however good your lines of defense are, if something goes wrong, there still has to be a cause. And if it isn't an individual, and it's not the policies and procedures, it could well be the culture. And actually, they have culture audits. I'm just raising this as the direction of travel these three C's are conduct, culture, and compliance. I, I think, fair question, when was the last time as a board we asked ourselves? A fantastic role for a company secretary and links to, to a theme I raised two years ago, which is, in my view, every board should have a board member who is a company secretary, which is a model in most countries, uh, most Western countries. And the raising of the role of a company secretary is vitally important on governance. Now, the third point is recognizing the changing landscape and the new reality. This is absolute buzzword bingo. Um, and it's a slogan. Uh, let me just try and bring it to life. Um, at KPMG, what we've done is we, we've got a framework 
to enable discussions. We've actually ended up using it more in our business than on our clients, to be honest. And it's the four R's. This was developed at the time when everybody thought we were emerging. And the first R was um, response. Uh, the second was resilience. The third one was recovery. And the fourth one was new reality. And trying to articulate those different phases countries, economies, sectors, and companies go through. And within that framework, you can have U-shaped recoveries, V-shape. I jokingly suggested a Z-shape, and someone took me seriously. But there's different shape recoveries. But a framework to look at how the company's interests are being safeguarded in different phases of a crisis is, is, is very helpful. As I said, economic crisis, but financial crisis is coming. When does the government money run out? When does this massive deployment and disruption of capital start to land and shake major variables such as interest rates, currencies, required rate of returns, etc.? You're already into negative interest rates. Yields on valuations, this type of thing, is coming. But um, there's four big themes which I think are coming out of this crisis. The first one is, what is the role of a company? I've increasingly felt like an employment agency as senior part of KPMG. Our responsibility to our employees and the way government, um, when government look at this, they see us as an employer, provider to two, two and a half thousand households. And our business, our bottom line, all of that is secondary. And you're back to the world where if you're making enough money to keep your people employed, looked after, etc., and doing the right thing with people, that is what people are expecting. I think it's now, purpose seemed a buzzword a few years ago. We couldn't get our arms around it. But the purpose of a company and the purpose of the business now is very, very important. So, I, as you know, I work very closely with Jockey Club, a lot of friends there. They now articulate their purpose is helping the community. No mention of horse racing. So I just want to share that with you. Now, linked to that is then breadth of stakeholders. Who would have thought the Bank of England would tell HSBC and Standard Chartered with probably one hour's notice it would be a good idea not to pay a dividend? On what basis, right? On what basis? But that's the world we live in. Don't pull loans on small, medium enterprises. This is the world we're in. So this rise of a stakeholder, and the biggest one which Moses touches on, is the customer. It's a, the customer's voice. So a combination of this, the changing expectation of a company, breakfast stakeholders, you've then got two other big things. The technological digital transformation. This is the biggest legacy from the virus whether you talk about ways of working, whether you talk about how you communicate, whether you talk about every single business model. I can tell you all our major clients are asking how can we digitalize a supply chain? How can we digitalize our shareholder communications, our compliance function? It's, it's a quantum shift forward. The other big thing which is fundamental change is the whole concept of sustainability. Roughly 25% of assets worldwide are managed through some lens, and you can define the lens maybe six or seven different ways, some lens of sustainability. I would suggest that would be 50% within three years, and certainly within our lifetime, maybe 10 years, it would be 100%. You have stranded assets, and we've got to realize that there's a pincer movement between all the regulators and central banks, all the major institutional pension funds and millennial investors to make this non-negotiable. So how as a board, on that new reality, does one work out, has one got the right strategy and the right risk? That's the point I want to make. There has to be a fresh discussion. And if we haven't had it, we need to get it on the table. So let, let's just move on to risk. I think the key point is absolute clarity of the board's responsibility for the management of risk. And that's a bold statement. Taking a step back and not falling into the trap of common misapprehensions. 
not falling into a trap of subcontracting responsibility to the audit committee or risk committee. If it's being handled by committees, is that in an advisory way or is actually in a delegated authority way? If it's a delegated authority way, as a board, one has to be darn sure it's being done properly. Audit committee agendas are getting overwhelming. Let's challenge ourselves on that. It also means ensuring risk management tools are in place. And there's a real risk of excessive comfort being given by attractive dashboards and uh, documents when the fundamental question of what is the risk appetite of the organization, what risk are we prepared to, to run, and do we make all decisions through that lens, often gets left behind. The aim is not to eliminate risk, but to identify the risk appetite and operate within it, and then promote the effective management of it. But what does proper management of it mean? It's oversight and understanding of business processes and internal controls. And I chair an INED forum every quarter, and I always throw back the challenge, how well do we all know the business? How well do we know, for example, how we are selling things to our customer? How well do we know all that is essential to the risk management? I'll speed up a bit. Another new consideration, which I think is absolutely fundamental, is that going concern and liquidity risk and cash flow forecasts need to be a new normal standing item consideration. I am amazed how many companies are not doing this. And when, let's say, they have a financing challenge, they do it, but six months later don't. As a board member in these very challenging, volatile times, one has to have a grip, surely, on what the future cash flow forecasts, availability of finances, available facility is, and there will be a gap. In the past, everybody said that gap would be filled by new facilities we can negotiate, or the magic words, shareholder support. That world may not be here anymore. All I'd say is, you look at a wonderful organization at Cathay Pacific, their scenario is totally different today to 12 months ago. Um, Patterns of demand, the demand we face, the market we serve, is it temporarily disrupted? Is it permanently disrupted? All of these things should go into these rolling forecasts, which I think should be done every half year as part of the approval of the results. A couple of other points, I'll speed up. What are the three hardest areas, I think, in risk management? The easiest is operational risk. Because as Moses mentioned, you can focus on controls. The hardest is what's happening outside and what it, what it means. As a board, how do we measure and identify, identify first, measure and mitigate external risk? Emerging risk, and one I really want to emphasize is third party risk. We're actually producing a report, I'll share with you later, on third party risk. This is the new big thing which is your whole supply chain, your whole organization is to an extent hostage to the weakest link in the chain in risk management. And this demand and understanding of how risk is being managed with third party suppliers is absolutely key. So if you're a major fund manager or you're a major bank, for example, how your custodian is handling things, how custodians themselves are handling their own suppliers, this is massively important. And I think outside the regulated industry, for years this has been grossly underestimated. The next step is lines of defense. Lines of defense is the ultimate buzzword bingo when talking about governance. Now is the time to challenge it. And if I can just share a few things. I think the first point would be it's extremely difficult outside financial services where it's very prescriptive and the regulators are very helpful to really define three lines of defense, but it is paramount to uh, governance. A couple of thoughts. The first line, which is the person doing the initial check, are they control conscious, but are they also risk aware? Is there a culture where they escalate when there's a problem? 
Do they communicate with the second and third line? The second line of defense, which traditionally in this part of the world has largely been financed and to an extent legal, is often missing on the operational and strategic parts. It could be the investment part of the business. And the third part, which is traditionally internal audit, is very good at saying what they've done, but not good at saying what they haven't done and what's left as a residual risk. You will find if you challenge the three lines of defense at board level, it would trigger a very, very healthy debate about how one's running a business. If we just move on just to the last couple of points, the importance of financial reporting and information flow and disclosure, I, I think it's a very simple statement here. I would be very, very careful at over-relying on the audit committee or the appointed financially literate director. And I would say it can't be left to the auditors and those board members with an accounting background. The numbers, what they mean, what trends could be pulled, the basis of it is far too important now for the board itself not to have a very, very good understanding. So a key part of safeguarding a board and a company is insisting on a very thorough run-through on the accounts, the audit, the main judgments, and what it can all mean. The right questions of the management and proactive challenge of a couple of things. Proactive challenge of the auditors. Have you told us everything you think you may be concerned? In a private session with us, please, please tell us everything. Use the specialists, such as valuers, pension valuers. Let's hold them to the fire. We're responsible for the accounts. What are they really saying us? What challenges do they have? So a big one at the moment on valuations is the cap rates in valuations, notwithstanding the enormous uncertainty we have, haven't changed in the six months from December to, um, to June, which is absurd. But that, that's the way valuers are approaching business, so be careful. And particular stress on intangible assets, goodwill, and transactions done in the last couple of years. The best way to safeguard the company is to have a real close look at intangible assets on the balance sheet, which many people would write off in their mind. And when we bought something, well, has the world changed? Is it still worth what we thought it was? And then just finally, just to wrap up, um, we talk about fit and proper. You, you're, you're dead right, Moses. I'll just add in my session, fit and proper for future purpose. And this is a massive opportunity to take a step back and look at board composition. A couple of weak areas one always sees is how to truly understand the customer voice, how to truly understand this new language of sustainability, how to truly understand the digital journey and the new economy. And I also think to ensure the sufficient seniority given to the very important role of the legal director uh, and company secretary. And then succession. It's very interesting. I think everybody here who's been involved in succession planning on boards, it's a very difficult thing. And it takes a long time. I'm on a couple of boards at the moment, and a few people would like to step down. I'd like to step down. We'd like to get some more people. This is not a great time to be trying to ask people to join boards but we've all got to have a really good look at it. And then just to wrap it all up, the best way to safeguard the company and the board is actually to really embrace this concept of a board effectiveness review. I'm not suggesting we get uh, KPMG to do it. I'm suggesting we can do it in-house ourselves. All the material is there. As a minimum, have a real step back, or maybe we can ask the independent directors to, to have a look at it. But I think that safeguarding the, the board and company by doing a review of board effectiveness and then learning from it, then everybody has a voice on how things can be done better or if there's anything we're missing, probably is very good practice. So let me draw it to a close there. Uh, these are the 10 steps I'll certainly be applying in the various roles I have. And hopefully there's one or two things there which can be helpful for you in your roles. Thank you.